Hello and welcome to today's webinar. I'm so glad that you could join me. I am super excited to share with you today uh, a little bit this about this technique I've been playing with recently, and that's creating custom quilting designs using the decorative stitches that are built into my machine and turning them into computerized quilting. Let me introduce myself. I am Haley Grish. I am a product educator for Bernina of America, and I am their top of the line specialist. And like I said, today we're really gonna focus in on how to create these designs and sew them out. There's so many fun and creative ways that you can take advantage of all the tools that are built into your machine. Things that live right at your fingertips that maybe you didn't realize were there. So today we will dive into this technique, but first I wanted to show you the project that I made with the result. I took my quilted yardage and made a super cute little iPad case. I travel quite a bit, so um, this helps keep my devices protected. I do have the full written instructions on how to make this project. Um, they're available for you to download. I'll talk about that right at the end. Um, we're really gonna just skim over this at the tail end today. I just wanna focus mostly on the quilting part um, through our chat today. Okay, so where should we get started? Maybe not everyone is super familiar with computerized quilting, so I think that's a good place to start. Let's consider all of the ways that you could quilt a quilt. You have free motion where your feed dog is dropped and you can move your fabric in any direction freely. That little asterisk um, is a note that you could do this with or without stitch regulation on your domestic machine. That would mean using the Bernina stitch regulator, um, but this is common on long arm uh, machines. Most of those will have stitch regulation that you can turn on and off. We have straight line quilting, and typically this is gonna be done with a walking foot. Uh, this could be simple stitch in the ditch, or maybe you get a little bit more complex, but ultimately it's all geometric shapes that are sewn with a presser foot that does use the feed dog to feed fabric straight through the machine. There is ruler work, which technically is a free motion technique, but it uses a specialty presser foot like our adjustable ruler foot number 72 and different shaped acrylic rulers to serve as guides to create intricate designs. This one is uh, something that I would like to spend a little bit more time practicing. <laughs> um, and then finally, we have computerized quilting. And when I say computerized quilting, if that clicks for you, it's probably in the context of long arm quilting. Your quilt is loaded on a frame and software like Qmatic moves the sew head to stitch out your desired design. But we can do this on our domestic machines too. You'll need your embroidery module and the embroidery hoops. The biggest hoop available is going to be best um, because that means you can quilt more of your quilt in one passing, less rehooping to get your project done. It allows you to stitch out intricate designs easily. I can do feathers and the tiniest micro stippling, anything my heart desires, even if my free motion skills aren't quite up to par for those techniques. And finding designs is really easy. There are some built into your machine. I'll show you where those are. Um, but you can also purchase them online. Embroideryonline.com was one of our sister companies. They have over 2,300 quilting designs for domestic machines. So that doesn't include long arm, like edge to edge, all of that. This is purely for domestic machines. There's so many on there, I can guarantee you will find something you like. And finally, remember that you're never limited just to designs that someone else has created for you. With embroidery digitizing software, like embroidery, uh, Bernina Embroidery Software V9, you can build anything that you can imagine. And let me show you a little bit what that might look like, a little insight to my own process if I'm designing a quilt. If I'm not working from a pattern, I like to first lay out my quilt ideas in software. For you, that may be electric quilt, EQ, super common. Um, but for me, that's Adobe Illustrator. I have a little bit of graphics background. I'm really comfortable in Illustrator, so that's the tool that I use. And in Illustrator, I can play with block size, positioning, audition colors, 
if I really feel like taking the time, I can even insert, insert swatches of the fabrics that I'm using into Illustrator. I can do all of the math, everything I can do digitally before I sit down and cut into any of my fabric. And I realized while working on a project that if I was designing my patchwork in Illustrator, why not also design the quilting there too? So for this design, um, I created for a class that I taught last year, and I created just five unique stitching files that when matched up with blocks, rotated, repositioned, create this quilt. It's really relatively simple to do if you're comfortable using any, set, any sort of graphic software. So then ultimately, this is how my quilt turned out. This is the finished quilt. It's hanging right in front of me. And it turned out exactly how I imagined because I was able to lay it all out ahead of time and digitize it and get everything to my liking to perfection before I even stitched it out. So here's a shameless plug. I am teaching this quilt in person um, coming up this May, uh, May 12th through 13th, 2022 at the Bernina Creative Center in Aurora, Illinois. A two-day class. You can come and hang out with me. We will quilt this quilt. We'll have a ton of fun and learn a lot about computerized quilting. Um, there is no patchwork involved. We actually have a panel version of this exact quilt that we're going to be stitching on. Um, and you can come hang out and, and learn hands-on how to do the technique that we're going to dip our toes into today. Shameless plug, I will include a link directly to registration for this if anybody is interested in joining me. Okay, now that you have some context for computerized quilting and how it fits in with the different types of quilting you can do, never think that you have to stick to just one of these. It's awesome to combine them, and maybe you start by doing a stitch in the ditch just to anchor your quilt sandwich together. And then looking at it, you find some areas that you think ruler work would be a really good fit for, and then add some computerized quilting in the areas that are maybe a little bit more complicated, and then fill in all the space around it and in between with free motion. So you have a lot of opportunity to get creative, Let's try combining all of these designs to add just a little bit of depth to the projects that you're working on. Okay, now let's get into the meat of this. How can we use decorative stitches to create quilting designs? First, let's think about decorative stitches for a moment. Depending on your machine, you probably have a maximum stitch width of either five and a half millimeters or nine millimeters. Other brands may have something different. Seven is really common. On a Bernina, it's five and a half or nine. As an embellishment, those sizes are great. If you're just adding a little trim to something, just a little touch of something extra, a nine millimeter stitch will be bold, but isn't too much. But as quilting, that's really, really tiny. Nine millimeters is like three eighths of an inch. So what if you had stitches that were bigger than that? In quilting, that means it's a stitch that's less dense. You have a little bit more variety and depth and texture created in your quilt. And ultimately that means faster quilting. Bigger design is gonna quilt faster. So do you know about sideways motion stitches? On some Bernina machines, the BA80 Plus and the B790 Plus specifically, we have what we call sideways motion stitches. These are decorative stitches that are larger than that maximum nine millimeters. You're probably wondering how that's possible. If there's a maximum, it should be the maximum. But these two machines, um, they work a little bit differently and the feed dog on these two can actually move the fabric in 360 degrees. So not just front to back or back to front, but it can also move the fabric left and right and everything in between. So we call this multi-directional sewing and these sideways motion stitches really take advantage of that. So let's take a look at exactly what that looks like. So in sewing on my machine, I have all of my stitches sorted into different folders, different tabs, which you can see on the right side of the machine. 
Right now I am in my decorative stitches tab. Within that, I have tons of folders of stitches, and those are sorted by either stitch type or theme. There's a commonality to each folder of stitches. And any folder with a little crosshair on it, which I have circled right there, that indicates that those are sideways motion stitches. So in this folder here, my 201 folder, all of the stitches here are going to be larger than nine millimeters. So this floral that I've selected now, this is coming in at 41.6 millimeters wide. For my fellow Americans, that is almost like one and three quarters inches wide. Our nine millimeter maximum is only, like I said, about three eighths of an inch. So this is quite a bit larger. And you can see how starting with a larger stitch like this can easily turn into a quilting design. So on our 880, on our 790, we have these giant stitches that are going to be the best choices for quilting. If a stitch is already fairly large, that means that I have less resizing, less editing to do to make that stitch how I want for quilting. But not all sideways motion stitches are created equal. Um, not all decorative stitches are going to work the same way. They won't all be a great option for quilting. So how do you know? What stitches work best? Number one, anything that from the get-go looks like an open, simple line work stitch. That means no satin stitching and no dense overlaps in the stitch pattern. I also say no triple stitches. These are decorative stitches that sew three passes over each stitch in the stitch pattern to give it a more pronounced look. And there are some quilting designs that are triple stitches as well, designs that you can purchase. Um, and honestly, this is just a personal preference. I prefer a single stitch line work because that's how my stitching looks if I do it free motion. I want this to look as similar to a uh, traditionally quilted quilt as I can get it to go. Again, the bigger the better. Even though we have some large stitches, likely you will have areas of your... Again, the bigger the better. Even though we have some really large stitches in the machine, likely you will have areas of your quilt that you need to fill that are larger than just one or two inches, and you'll want to enlarge the decorative stitch to fill that space. The larger your starting design, the better the finished result. The more you scale a design or edit or morph a design, the more opportunity there is for issues with stitched, stitch density and tension and all sorts of other things. So start with something that is uh, relatively close to what you're looking for as the end result. And you want your decorative stitches to come together seamlessly. This one, unfortunately, is a little bit trial and error. Some stitches have built-in securing stitches at the end of the stitch pattern. And honestly, some of those are more dramatic than others. When we create a row of that decorative stitch and embroidery, those securing stitches can add a obvious kind of point or knot in the middle of my line of quilting. And really the only way to see this is when your stitch is opened in embroidery. You can zoom in, view stitch by stitch in your stitch pattern, and identify these kinds of things. So again, it's a little bit trial and error. You don't quite have to go to the point of sewing out to figure this out. Um, but anyway, you're going to be playing with stitches and auditioning what you think will work best with your quilt. So you'll find the best fit along the way. Now we get to actually set up our stitch and embroidery. When we do this, this feature is exclusive to the Bernina 880 plus, the 790 plus, and the B590. So those sideways motion stitches, those large, larger than nine millimeter stitches are only in the 880 plus and the 790 plus. So you can use stitches and embroidery on the 590. And there are plenty of instances where doing so is really cool and really helpful. Um, but you won't be able to use those large sideways motion stitches. 
all of that is to say it's totally doable. It just may take a little bit more finessing to get exactly the result that you're looking for, if that makes sense. Okay, so what we are gonna do now is pop over to my machine simulator and let's enlarge that. Okay, so now you can see my 790. Let's take a look at what we can do with decorative stitches over here. When I go to the machine and um, I'm at my embroidery home screen, this is where we are always gonna start with embroidery on a Bernina. You have four folders presented in front of you. First, you have your alphabets and you can do the, use these to create lettering or monograms, whatever you'd like. The second folder here is uh, all of your embroidery motifs. So these are the designs really that are built into the machine. There's a little bit of everything in here. There are some lace designs. There are some applique designs, monograms, all sorts of cute stuff. Um, but I wanna call your attention to folder number two. These are quilting designs. So like I said, there are, are already computerized quilting designs built into your machine. You can go and purchase some. There are plenty out there for you if, if none of these suit your taste. But there's a lot in here that can get you started and you can play a little bit with te this technique and get some experience, feel it out before you go and purchase anything. So take a look at these. There's some really cute stuff here to get started with computerized quilting. Next, we have our stitches. So this looks just like the stitch icon that is in the sewing side of your machine. And that's where we're gonna find all of our stitches. Again, like the tabs in sewing, you have your practical stitches, you have your decorative stitches, you have alphabets, you have buttonholes, and you have quilting stitches. We are gonna play with decorative stitches today. So I'm gonna open that up. And again, all of those same folders show up with that same little crosshair for your sideways motion stitches. So let's go back to that floral that I pulled before. That's in this folder, the 201 folder, and it is stitch number three here. Let's zoom in and take a look at our stitch. So this comes in, it's telling me that size that it said uh, in sewing, 41 millimeters by 72 millimeters. So for those of us out there who do not work in metric, maybe we want to switch over to be, being able to read this in imperial measurements. And I can do that. I'm going to go to my settings on the machine and I will go to my embroidery settings. And then I'm gonna select this little tape measure here. And here I can toggle if I wanna read in millimeters or inches in embroidery. This is just an embroidery. It's not gonna change anything on the sewing side because in sewing we're working with much smaller pieces, um, much smaller elements. The precision of metric in working in millimeters is needed over there, so you won't ever see your sewing stitches in inches. But in embroidery, sometimes because we're working at a larger scale, being able to read in inches and really get the context for the size of things is super helpful. So I'll close out my menu, and now you can see this is 1.6 inches by 2.8 inches. And that's pretty big. Um, we can scale it up. Generally with embroidery, we recommend scaling, staying between, staying within 20% of the original size. So either up 20% or down 20%. When you get outside of that range, things like density, uh, stitch density um, can be affected. You'll see this more with a traditional embroidery design and less than less in something like this, this kind of line work, but you can still have problems. So let's zoom in, get a good look at this design. I'm gonna go to my information menu and go to scaling. I will resize this design. Let's make it a little bit bigger. So at 120%, this design is now two inches wide. And honestly, this the way that I'm looking at it on my screen is fairly close to being true to size. Um, and already I can see a couple of issues happening here. 
let's zoom in a little bit more. Maybe not the, quite that much, but I can see some inconsistencies in the stitch. I can see this little gap here where I want, I should have my lines meet. The biggest thing that comes to, comes to my eye is this. These two lines are not overlapping precisely the way that they should. And when you're working with this stitch at the intended size, this would be imperceptible. It would probably actually stitch into the same point in your fabric. But when you scale this up and make it larger, those little inconsistencies, um, they're not inconsistencies, those little design elements can turn into something else. So again, I have a little bit of like kind of weird overlap here, a gap down here I don't love. This is overlapping in a way I'm not crazy about. So even though in theory, this stitch should scale up just fine, it's maybe not going to be a great fit or it's just not what I'm looking for. May be totally fine for you and it may be totally fine when you actually stitch it out in your fabric and everything, but for today's purpose, this is not what we're going to go with. I want to try something different. Let me clear that out and I'm going to add a new stitch. In my stitch folder, I'll go to decorative stitches and then I'm going to go over to folder 1601. These, these stitches in my 790 um, are actually very well intended to be quilting stitches. If you look at them, they look quite a bit like quilting or like free motion quilting, I should specify. These tulips are super cute. We have a couple different kinds of little loops. Um, there's a ribbon candy design. There's all sorts of cute stuff in here. Some little like waves and swirls that when put together and, and stitched in a row would create a really beautiful quilting design. So there's tons to play with in here. There's even some stippling. Um, you can take this into embroidery and have your machine embroider stippling. I'm going to use stitch number 20, this little leaf design. I just think it's cute and it really goes with um, kind of the vibe I'm looking for on this project, with my fabrics. And this is coming in at 0.8 inches by 0.8 inches. So the way that I want um, my quilting to stitch out, I'm sewing on this striped fabric, right? So I have these colored lines, colored stripes across my fabric, and the background is this white. I want to fill the background with the decorative stitch. And I measured, there's about a two inch gap between these brightly colored lines on my fabric. So I want my quilting design to be just shy of that. I don't want it running right, right up because that gives me no room for error. It also doesn't account for kind of the thickness of the fabric and things like that. So I want my quilting design to actually be about one and three quarters of an inch wide. So I can have about an eighth of an inch of wiggle room on either side. So that's what I'm looking for to set this up at. Back at my simulator, I'm gonna go and resize this design. I'm going to scale this up, which takes a lot of clicking. So let's see, 150% gets me one and a quarter ish. It's going to take me a while to just press this button. Because I have already tested this, I'm going to go and pull up a version of this stitch that I've already edited. So this one I have already scaled up to the size that I'm looking for. 1.8 inches by 1.7 inches. Now, how do I turn this one single stitch into a nice continuous row of quilting? There's a couple ways you could do it. The labor intensive way would be to duplicate this and then try and eyeball and line things up. I don't wanna do that. Um, and my machine has a tool that's going to do that work for me. That's called Endless Embroidery. So this little icon here with the butterflies, that is my Endless Embroidery tool. So what is Endless Embroidery? 
this tool will take whatever design or motif that you're working with and automatically fill the hoop vertically with as many of those that design that it thinks that it can fit. So often this is used to embroider like borders on something. If you're doing a tablecloth or a, a runner or something like that, you can take one design and fill a really long length with just that single design repeated over and over. Then what it will also do, which you can see kind of on the left part of the screen, is add in these registration arrows. So if I add these in, which they're going to be a little bit tricky to see um, because the design I'm working with is so small, you can see maybe these little tiny red arrows that show up in my design and it will have the machine sew out that arrow as a really long basting stitch. It's easy to remove later on. But those give you points to align to when you have to rehoop and move down to the next section of your project. So again, there's a, there are instances where that's super helpful. Today, not so much for me. Um, so I'm going to take away all of my registration arrow options. Then on the right side, you will see a 9x here. That's because the machine thinks that I can fit nine of my stitches through the length of my embroidery hoop. Now, I know that I can get more in there because the machine doesn't understand how these nest together. To accommodate for that, the next tool down here is our spacing. So I can choose to either increase the space between my designs, my hoop is turning red because it thinks that the design is being placed outside of the hoop. So let's go back and let's actually decrease the spacing between these designs. And you can get to a really fine tune adjustment here working in a tenth of a millimeter increments. I want to decrease this until it looks like my designs are lining up perfectly, which because I have tested this, I know that it is negative 13 millimeters. Let's see. All right, negative 13, I know will give me exactly the results that I'm looking for. This might be a little bit of trial and error for you to test, depending on the stitch that you use, the spacing might be different. For this stitch, I know it's 13. So I'm going to select my green check mark to confirm. And there I have my continuous quilting design. I have this measuring 1.8 inches by 11.6 inches. That's perfect. Um, that will fit neatly within a half yard of fabric. That's the amount of yardage that I'm going to be quilting. So this design really is ready to stitch out. Let's come back. And before we can sew this out, we need to talk about the quilting process in general a little bit. And the first place to start is always going to be your fabric. So the basics of a quilt sandwich, you're going to start with your quilt top. That may be patchwork pieced. It may be whole cloth. Today we're doing a whole cloth thing. Generally, this is going to be a mid to lightweight woven fabric. And again, generally, typically this is made from natural fibers. So cotton, linen, things like that. The fabric that I used for my sample, the actual fabric I used, is a chore coat stripe by Alexia A. Beg of Ruby Star Society. Um, this fabric is really interesting. It's like the yarns itself, the yarns themselves are a little bit thicker and nubbier, um, but the weave is a little bit more open. So it has kind of a chunkier texture, but um, it isn't necessarily heavy weight. Um, it's a really cool fabric. I really enjoyed working with it, actually. Um, but that's what I used. Next, batting. That's the next layer of our sandwich. Here we could use either natural or synthetic fibers. You could use 100% cotton batting. 80-20 um, and 80% cotton, 20% polyester blend is super common as well. 
the more synthetic fiber you have woven into or bonded in, because these are this is a non-woven product, the more synthetic fiber you have bonded into your batting, the more durable it's going to be, the less likely, or the it's, going, it's just going to hold up through a lot more washing and wearing and loving. If I'm making baby quilts, I am using polyester batting because those are getting washed. They're getting washed. Um, for my own quilts that I make at home, I usually use cotton. I might use bamboo if I'm making a lighter weight summer quilt. Silk blended into your batting gives it a really lovely drape. It's also really lightweight and soft. Um, and you may also use wool. Wool used to be a lot more common than it is now, um, but it makes really beautiful quilts as well. Wool batting is really lightweight, but it's really fluffy. So it's going to appear thicker, but is physically lighter weight than cotton. So then my, to my next point, higher low loft, cotton typically is a low loft. It's thinner feeling and thus um, your fabric isn't, or your quilting isn't going to appear quite as like pronounced on a cotton batting, at least compared to wool batting. The like puffiness of wool is going to make your quilting look um, really dense, uh, not dense, it's going to look a little bit puffier. It's going to be more defined on a wool quilt than it will on cotton. So the combination of these things you need to consider. Your fiber, the loft that you're looking for, because often fibers are available in multiple levels of loft, either low for a thinner batting or high loft for a thicker, puffier batting. Um, and then also consider your quilting density. How def these, these, all of these things will affect how defined your quilting looks in the finished result. So in my sample, I used a 100% cotton batting, a low loft cotton batting, but I actually used two layers of it um, because I did want something that would be a little bit thicker that would allow my quilting to stand out just a little bit more than just a single layer of cotton batting. And I really like the result. And finally, your backing. Similar to the quilt top, this may be pieced or it may be whole cloth. Um, again, it's going to be a mid to lightweight woven. Um, quilting cotton, um, cotton sateens are really nice. Maybe flannel if you want a cozier quilt. Um, and then for large quilts, you may want to look for a what is called a 108 wide back cotton. So traditional with the fabric for quilting cottons is 44 to 45 inches. These are, as the name implies, 108 inches wide, which is going to be large enough for even a king size quilt. That means you don't have to buy like eight yards of fabric and piece them all together in order to put a backing on your like full or queen size quilt. You can use 108 and not have to deal with any sort of piecing on the back. Um, for my back of my quilt, I just use quilting cotton. This is another one from Alexia for our for Ruby Star, um, and this is an unbleached cotton. Next, you will need to baste your quilt. There are three main choices for basting. First, pin basting. I'm going to use large safety pins to hold together the layers of your quilt sandwich. The downside is that it can be uncomfortable to layer your quilt sandwich out on a layer, layer quilt out on an area that is large enough for that quilt. Um, and usually that means crawling around on the floor. I don't know about you. My back and my knees don't love when I do that. So I try to avoid pin basting or at least doing it that way. Um, it also can add a not insignificant amount of weight to your quilt, which really isn't great if you're computerized quilting. You don't want extra weight pulling away from the machine. Um, and it also can be a little bit tricky to maneuver around those pins when you're trying to hoop. Not to say you can't do it, but it does certainly present an extra challenge. Next, spray basting. Um, 
this is going to be a low tack spray adhesive that will bond one layer of your quilt to the next. So your quilt top to your batting and then your batting to your backing. Again, the crawling around on the floor thing. Um, there are some other methods for spray basting that you could do on a tabletop. Uh, Crystal Watson has some really great tips on that that I've tried. Um, it definitely helps, um, but also uh, there are fumes. If you're spray basting, you wanna make sure you're doing that in a well-ventilated area. You probably don't want to do it with pets and kids around. It's not great. Um, and it also doesn't hold up for extended periods of time. So if you are someone who can quilt your quilt in a reasonable amount of time after you've basted it, probably a great option. No drawbacks at all with that. Um, if you are like me and you have a pile of UFOs stacked up and they're spray basted, not all of them are very well basted anymore because that, that adhesive just deteriorates over time, which is good and bad. You don't want it to live forever in your finished quilt, but if it takes you a long time to quilt, it's not going to hold up. Finally, there is thread basting. So thread basting is a little bit less common. It uses a long running stitch, usually at least an inch long, sometimes three, four inches long. If you do it by hand, um, you can do it by hand or at the machine. Your domestic machine does have um, some basting stitches in it, some really long ones. Um, and you can do this also using uh, the BSR. So on your Q-series machines in a table, so if you're working on the Q16, Q16 Plus or Q20 in a table, the 24 also has basting, but you don't need to baste it if you're on a frame. If you're working on a table, you can use BSR Mode 3 to free motion baste your quilt. Um, and you can also use BSR Mode 3 on the B770QE+. At this time, BSR Mode 3 is only on the 770QE+, but it's there if you want to use it, and it's a really great tool. Okay, next we have our quilt. We have it basted. Now we need to hoop it. Hooping your quilt is pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. Like any other quilting technique, I like to work from the center out if I am quilting a quilt. Um, for my project today, again, I'm just quilting some yardage, about half a yard. My fabric that I had on hand was actually a little bit larger. It was about two thirds of a yard, but half a yard is plenty for this. Um, and I just worked from one end to the other. But again, if you were doing an actual quilt, you would probably want to start in the center and work your way out. So you will place the inner ring of your embroidery hoop on the right side of your fabric on your quilt top, and then pick it all up, slide it over, and press it down onto the outer ring of your embroidery hoop. This does take a little bit of effort, depending on your fabrics, if it's pieced or not, um, the, um, the thickness of your batting, um, all of those things will determine the amount of resistance you might feel. So it's gonna vary a little bit. So with my fabrics, I used that chore coat fabric, which is a little bit thicker and quite textured, two layers of batting, and then my quilting cotton it definitely was a snug fit getting it in, but I wouldn't say that I had any issues with it. I got in there just fine. And then after that, you will tighten the hoop. On my jumbo hoop, I have the twist lock mechanism. This is gonna be on the jumbo, the maxi, and the midi hoops. And I'm gonna turn that little dial just until I hear, <clears throat> just until I hear that first loud click. Don't keep tightening after that um, because you're just going to, you're going to hurt the mechanism that keeps your hoop tight. So get to that one big click and then stop. And at that point, you do not want to pull or tug at your fabric at all once it is hooped because it's just going to shift and warp. You'll end up with puckering. Um, it's only going to hurt the finished result of your quilt or whatever project you're embroidering. I will, however, push the inner ring through 
push it down just slightly so that the quilt back is about like a sixteenth of an inch past the outer ring on the underside. And this is just going to help prevent any hoop burn that you might see on the bed of the machine. It's protecting my machine more than anything else. Finally, finishing touches. These are going to vary. Um, if you are working on a whole quilt with starts and stops in the middle and things like that, you'll want to bury your thread tails. Um, I am very traditional in that sense. I don't like to knot my threads and snip them. I like to take a hand sewing needle, thread the thread tails, and bury them in my quilt. That's just the way that I like to do it. Um, but for my project today, quilting this yardage, my start and stop points are going to get trimmed off, so I'm not really going to mess too much with, with that stuff. Okay, so our design is all set up, and let's get ready to position it and stitch it out. So I have a couple of tips on positioning and um, some settings to check for stitching out computerized quilting. So number one, there are a lot of different ways that you can position designs and embroidery, but my favorite and the most precise option is pinpoint placement. As I mentioned, I want my quilting to fit neatly within these wide white stripes on my fabric. Pinpoint placement is going to help me position my design perfectly straight down and make sure that I don't stitch into the actual colored lines here. It's just going to fit perfectly within that little gap. So let's jump over to our simulator again and take a look at pinpoint placement. Pinpoint placement is this little tool right here. And what this lets me do is choose any two points on my design, move them where I need to in regard to the hoop and my project and anchor those points. So I will start with one um, and then anchor it and then choose any second point and anchor it into its own position. So let's take a look at what this looks like. I have two different options of using pinpoint placement. I can use the grid, which is gonna give me um, nine points at uh, the vertical uh, centers at the top, bottom, and center, the horizontal center on the left, middle, and right, and then each of the four corners. And I can choose any one of these points move it where I need to, and then anchor it. There's also free point, which is actually what I found to give me a better result with this project. Free point lets me choose any point on my design. And I mean literally any specific point. I can zoom in and select a literal exact stitch that I want to sew out. So on my design, to get things lined up in this perfect straight line, even if I haven't hooped my fabric straight, to nest this perfectly into the stripe, um, I am first going to choose a point at the top left, and you can see kind of a map of where we are on the design up here. I'm gonna choose this stitch here because I think it's the furthest to the left and I'm going to use my multifunction knobs and move my design either left or right, up or down. And when I do that, the machine is going to move, the machine is going to move my hoop in order to match where I'm moving the point on this design. So I will move that point that I chose until it is about an eighth of an inch away from one of my colored stripes, which you can see here. I'm just going to rock my needle down to see exactly where that needle, I can see where my needle is right here is exactly where that stitch is going to sew out. So I like where that's spaced and what I'm going to do, again back at the simulator, we're going to do a little jumping back and forth, is I'm going to set that point. 
and now that stitch is anchored. I decided that I want this stitch to sew out at that point on my fabric and it's not moving. That's where it's going to land. Now, like I said, in order to accommodate for maybe not hooping perfectly straight, so maybe I hooped with my stripes kind of at an angle, I'm going to move my design and swing it out so it, it's at the same angle. So I'm going to zoom back in and the second point I'm going to choose is going to be basically opposite the first one. So first I chose a top left corner. Now I'm going to choose a bottom right corner and zooming in here. This looks like it's kind of falling, falling furthest to the right. So I'm going to take this point and again, using those multifunction knobs, the top ones are going to move left and right. So I want to just swing it this way. And my hoop is moving while I'm making these adjustments. I'm seeing the change in real time. So whatever the case may be, maybe I need to move it, you know, a little bit to the right and a little bit up. As I'm doing this, eventually I will end up with that stitch that I've selected again shooting for an eighth to a sixteenth of an inch away from the next colored stripe so I know that my quilting design is going to land right between um, those two stripes and it's going to fill that little white that white stripe that white gap in there so again I will hit set and now my design is ready to embroider. It's positioned exactly where I want it to go. Before we move to the stitch out screen, there are a couple of settings. Like I mentioned before, there, there are some settings that I wanna check in my machine because we're doing com computerized quilting. I'm quilting in the hoop here. I'm not just stitching on a layer of fabric and some stabilizer. This technique is a little bit different. I don't want the exact same settings that I would use for traditional embroidery. So I'm going to go into the settings menu on my machine again and back into these embroidery settings. Remember earlier we changed our measurements from millimeters to inches using the little tape measure icon here. But there are two others that I want to adjust. Number one is my securing stitches. I told you that I like to do things the old fashioned way. I like to bury my thread tails. And so because I do things that way, I'm not relying so much on some securing stitches at the beginning of my sewing, of my embroidery. By default, these securing stitches are turned on. So by default, the machine wants to take a couple securing stitches at the beginning of any stitching segment and then a couple stitches at the end. I don't want that because I want the top side of my fabric to be, I want the underside of my fabric of my quilt to be just as pretty as the top side and those securing stitches sometimes can create knots and it's just not super pretty. I'm bearing my thread tail so I'm going to turn off these securing stitches. Next is cutting. Here I have deactivated cutting so the first one is a uh, an automatic cut between color changes. So anytime the machine identifies a color change between elements of your design, it will stop and cut the threads and then stop the embroidery completely in order for to allow you to change the thread spools. I'm turning that off because I'm not doing multiple color changes today. I'm just running a single stitch design, um, one continuous line through my fabric. The second um, is a setting where the machine, when activated, will take the first couple of stitches in your design and then stop to allow you to get in there with your thread snips and trim thread tails. Again, I'm leaving my thread tails in um, and so I don't need the machine to pause for me to do that. So both of these settings are going to be deactivated here. One more 
which is something that maybe you haven't thought of when it comes to quilting in the hoop, and that's thread tension. Traditional embroidery has unbalanced tension. That's what you want. You want your bobbin thread to be uh, at a much higher tension than your upper thread in embroidery because when you're working in fills in like a satin fill or a step fill, really anything, any embroidery stitch, you want your upper thread to be pulled to the back just a little bit because that's what's going to give that really pretty finish on the right side of your fabric. Um, it ensures that you're, you don't have any bobbin threads popping up. But we're quilting, we're not embroidering here today. And when you're working on a quilt, you want your thread tensions to be balanced. You want your threads to meet in the middle of your quilt sandwich. You shouldn't see any bobbin thread from the top, but you also shouldn't see any top thread from the back. So I need to balance out my thread tension a little bit. Rather than touching anything in the bobbin, because we don't want to do that, I'm going to just adjust my upper thread tension, which, because we're in embroidery, it's set quite a bit lower than it would be in sewing. Three is relatively low tension on the upper thread. So that's allowing, it's giving more power to the bobbin to pull that upper thread to the back. But I want some tension on my upper thread because I want those, those threads to meet in the middle. So I'm gonna turn this up a little bit. This is gonna be, again, a little trial and error because it really depends a lot on your thread, on your batting, things like that. If you're doing patchwork or if you're doing whole cloth, like there's a lot of different things that can come into play in order to give you ideal thread tension. So always test stitch. When I sewed mine out, my machine, my fabrics, everything like that, 4.25 was about enough. I didn't really need to crank it up a whole lot higher than that in order to get a really pretty balanced stitch. It was maybe, I maybe could have raised it a little bit, but I was, I was happy with the result at 4.25. Okay, now we can actually sew this out and I'm going to move to my embroidery sew out screen. A couple more boxes to check. I promise we're almost there. On this screen, we have um, some extra settings uh, on the right side here. Number one, this one to look for, more of those scissors. We don't want scissors. Make sure this is turned off. This setting is um, cutting jump stitches. I don't want the machine to cut jump stitches. If for some reason my individual um, decorative stitch patterns weren't perfectly aligned, if the start of one pattern didn't perfectly match up with the end of the previous one, the machine is going to create a small jump stitch, which I actually don't mind in this case because it's just gonna blend in with the rest of the line of quilting. Jump stitches are good in this case, so we don't want the machine to cut them. The next thing I wanna set is uh, this setting right here, and that's to run the design as a mono monochromatic design. This is saying, this is telling the machine to ignore all thread color changes that the machine might be reading. So um, technically, this design, as I scroll through, the thread color is all the, all the same, but it's reading as thread color changes. So if I didn't have this on, the machine would sew this stitch pattern and then stop. And I would have to press the button again and get it to sew the next one and then it would stop and I'd have to press the button and then it would go and you can see. So if I turn this on to have it run as a monochromatic design, it's now gonna read this as like, okay, all of these things are the same color, then I can just keep on going and just speed right through. So with that said, we can get to actually quilting. When we start, just like you would on a typical quilt, bring up your bobbin thread to the top side of the fabric. There's a couple ways you can do this. Um, I mean, you can use the hand wheel to pull, to drop your needle down and pull it back up to pull up the bobbin thread, or you can press the needle up down button on the front of the machine. I'll show you right here. 
um, on your machine, it's right here. In sewing, if you press this button, it's just going to either drop the needle or raise it. In embroidery, it's going to make a full rotation to take a complete stitch. So it's great in this instance because I'll just hold my thread, press the button, and it'll complete a rotation and I'll be able to pull my bobbin thread up. And then I can press my start stop button and, uh, and quilt my fabric. It seems like it took a lot of steps to get there, um, but at this point, it's just rinse and repeat. You will stitch out one row and then add the next one, position it, and stitch it out. Um, with my quilting design, I did rotate it 180 degrees each time so that my little leaves would alter direct, uh, alternate direction. That's just an aesthetic choice. That's just what I felt like doing that day. Um, your stitch, you may want to mirror left, right. You can play with a lot of different things um, to get this quilted exactly the way that you want it quilted. So you can use this technique to make all kinds of quilted goods. You can do a traditional quilt. You could um, quilt um, some patchwork or whole cloth in order to turn it into garments. You could uh, quilt fabric to make it into accessories like this, um, or a backpack, or even jewelry. I've seen some really cute like quilted necklaces and collars. There's so much that you can do uh, with this technique. And again, I'm showing you here for this project a really, really quick skim through how I put this together, just because I don't want to totally ignore it. You do have the written instructions available for you to download if you want to make one yourself. But what I did was I quilted a half yard of fabric and I cut that yardage into two pieces. Then my two pieces being this smaller front piece and a larger back piece. I bound the top edge of my smaller piece. Then I basted my three sides together and in the process I added a little elastic tab on the inside. So in here I can slip in my little Apple Pencil if I'm traveling with that. Baste these three sides and then add bias binding around the perimeter. I added that to attached it like on the inside here and then flipped it over to the right side and I actually hand stitched um, with uh, a 12 weight cotton thread, uh, like hand quilting. So the, the, cotton, the thread is visible on the outside. I just like a little added hand, hand sewn touch, just an extra little detail that makes something feel handmade, which in my opinion is a good thing. So this is how the project turned out. I think it is really cute. Um, it is, it has been great already for me to travel with my iPad. Um, there's also a little, there's an elastic loop here um, with a large button for the closure on the front to create kind of a little envelope closure. And that is the project. It's been super fun to dive into this technique again that handout and a whole bunch of other resources are available for you. The link is here, bit.ly slash quilt deck stitches. This is case sensitive, so that Q, the D, and the S need to be capitalized for that, that link to work. Um, but your handout is there. Um, there is a link to this presentation that I've gone through. If you just kind of want to skim through it on your own time at your own pace later, you can do that. There is a link to the registration for that Creative Center class that I'm teaching in May. If you want to come out to Aurora and do some computerized quilting with me, um, there is a link to Embroidery Online where you can download all of those quilting designs. Um, and if there are any other resources that come to mind um, as I field questions from this webinar, things that I think will help you out in the process, I will add those to the folder that this links to. So it is uh, a living document. It's something that I can continue to update for you 
if this is something that you're interested in, in following along with. My contact information is here. I am Haley Grish. Um, this is my email, hgrish at berninausa.com. And if you want to find me on the internet, um, on Instagram, things like that, my username is just my name. Very simple. Uh, and with that, thank you all again for joining me today. It's been really fun. And hopefully I will see you on the internet.